Um, my jujitsu that I'm teaching is always taking into account the possibility of strikes. And um, again, I come from a striking background, as you know, just like you, Master John, and, and, and Jesse as well. So um, I'm very, very comfortable with the idea of, hey, if someone's inside my closed guard, they could be hitting me right now if I'm not paying attention to their hands, their posture, where their body's at, how I'm lined up with them, um, how to get past their strikes to get the clinch initially. Um, if I'm on the bottom of side control, how do I deal with strikes? Or even if I'm on the top position from mount, they might be reaching, gouging, trying to grab me. Or if I'm being mounted, for those at, at home that are like, you know, not quite understanding, if I'm laying on my back and somebody's sitting on my belly like a bully trying to hit me, how do I deal with that? And I think the jujitsu that's being taught today is more jujitsu on jujitsu game. I know jujitsu. The guy knows jujitsu. We played jujitsu together, as I mentioned in an earlier podcast. The jujitsu that I like to teach is okay. I'm learning jujitsu so that the 99% of the population that doesn't know jujitsu, that might be my attacker, I want to know like how to defend against that person. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Conversations from the Heart. Today, we are joined by Master Jason Zakrajcik. He's up in Chagrin Falls, and we're excited to have him on back on Conversations from the Heart. Welcome, sir. Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for having me again today. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. So, uh, Professor Jason or Master Jason, I'm going to call you Professor Jason just because you're going to be coming to do your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu seminar. That's what we usually call Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructors. Perfect. But you are a master. You're a very accomplished martial artist, and we're super excited to have you. And one of the reasons we wanted you to come on is because we wanted to get people to know you a little bit better so they can get excited to come to the seminar because I think it's a rare opportunity for them to learn those really essential self-defense uh, techniques. We had you on not too long ago and you were telling us about how your program is a little bit different than a lot of the programs out there. And I'm really excited about that because I kind of come from a similar background in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as you, although recently I found a lot of the more sport Jiu-Jitsu schools uh, that I've been training at. And I'm really excited to deep dive into some of those more traditional Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu techniques that are all about the self-defense. And the question I wanted to pose for you today not to make this too much of a speech, is, you know, what are the essentials for self-defense within Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or in martial arts as a whole, as you have learned it and developed your, you know, fighting game? And I think the, probably the best place to start, and I have some things I kind of want to say on this too that I was thinking about on the ride over here this morning, um, is a mindset and principles or mindset and, you know, and philosophies uh, what do you think is most important in that realm for self-defense? Well, uh, as far as mindset, number one, I believe the practice of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or any martial art that one believes in, uh, is going to develop a bit of self-confidence in that individual to either verbally de-escalate or verbally sort of stand up for themselves in a situation that might be a little bit, you know, of a conflict. Number one, it's also going to have increased awareness aspects where people are going to feel like they're going to be a little bit more aware of their surroundings and avoid a potentially dangerous situation. So the, 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 the mindset, in, in my opinion, is, you know, the self-confidence that one would get from actually practicing the martial art and believing in their own words. If I have to verbally de-escalate or verbally assert myself. If I've been practicing martial arts that I truly believe in, I'm going to have the confidence and conviction in my words to back that up. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have to go through a list of order of operations and priorities when it comes to self-defense, given the individual context. If I'm a child trying to get away from a larger you know, abduction situation or a woman trying to defend themselves against a much larger opponent, or if I'm someone who's perhaps um, maybe like a male or someone like you or I, who are trying to 
get a suspect or someone under control and uh, and sort of rid the situation and prevent them from doing further damage. I'm going to approach each one of these situations with a bit of a different mindset, a different order of operations, and a different list of priorities. Mm -hmm. Again, depending on the context. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. I can just jump in there. You know, uh, one of the things that I think is so important. Um, when people come to learn martial arts, and a lot of times people come to learn martial arts and they say to me, I want my, my kid, my kid's getting picked on at school and I want him to be able to defend himself. And I say, okay, yeah, we can help you with that. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, just being able to defend yourself isn't necessarily the solution. Because if let's say somebody's getting up in your face and talking, you know, calling you names and being rude to you, and you all of a sudden just punch him in the face, everyone's going to think you're the bad guy, you know? It's not necessarily just being able to defend yourself that can resolve the situation. I mean, you've been a martial artist your whole life. I've been in my whole life. When I was a kid, I could defend myself and I did martial arts all the time, but I, I, I felt sort of my hands were tied because you can't just go around punching people in the face, <laughs> you know? Um, sure. And so what I always try to impress upon students is the social skills are so important because if you have good social skills, you'll be a, a leader amongst your peers. People will gravitate towards you. You won't get isolated and you won't get picked on in the first place. And so that's really important. And in our Little Warriors program, that's one of the things that we're really focused on. But the reason why I'm saying all of this is because it kind of links up with you, what you were just saying, which is another really important aspect is the physical socialization. Um, I had a... Uh, a couple of white belts back in my college program that um, had never been like physically socialized so that when we started, when they started their training, they were out um, at the bar one time and one of them was like, hey man, how's it going? He gave him a little you know, chest bump, like a little bump on his chest as a friend kind of thing. But he took it as like an aggressive action and he didn't really understand. And he, he sucker punched the other guy and knocked him out. Oh. It was a way overreaction. Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of thing that can happen if you haven't been physically socialized. And also, you know, you can get into a situation where you're just like deer in the headlights. You're all locked up. How many people do you know when you were growing up and through the martial arts who say, yeah, but you don't know when I go to really defend myself, I'm going to be like a rabid wombat. I'm going to get in there and be all, you know, all fire. You're probably not going to be that. You're probably going to be that deer in the headlights unless you've had that physical socialization where you're rolling around, you know, getting stuck in north-south position with your face up against somebody's. Uh, garage you know for three minutes sure. and, and, and you 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 are comfortable in any of those positions when you have that confidence physically you're going to have that confidence physically when you have to defend yourself yeah there's no question about it and, and again as we always say when we're teaching self-defense seminars uh you know women's self-defense seminars and just even when i'm working with different civilian groups or even you know officers um, you know, avoidance and awareness would be, you know, the number one self-defense. Being able to, again, in a situation, verbally de-escalate or assert myself to thwart a, a, a potential attack situation or something that could go get a little bit out of hand is of paramount importance. That's like number one. And, and just as you alluded to, if you're out on the mats rolling and you're being pressure tested on a weekly basis, um, you're used to punches coming at your face and kicks and being on the mats, like you said, being pressed in, in very tight situations, um, you feel a bit accomplished, a bit tested, and you're going to be able to be calm when you need to verbally de-escalate situation. You're not going to get riled up, like you said, that friend of yours were, or the person you knew who did the sucker punch. They weren't really physically socialized or they didn't have uh, that sort of confidence or that calm in a situation that may, uh, could, well, could have been easily resolved. Also, even for women or children that want to verbally assert themselves to get someone to truly stop and to speak up, to give them eye contact, to do things that would be very, very important in stopping a potential attack. Um, if you've never tested yourself in a martial arts setting, you don't have the confidence to really back up those words. So by being on the mats, learning self-defense of, of any type that you truly believe in, you're going to have a bit more, as I said earlier, conviction in your words. You're going to have a, a certain uh, a volume. Uh, and, and a certain energy to your tone that's going to make all the difference in the world. And that, that alone is, is, you know, very important for self-defense. Um, you know, I, I really think that most things can be avoided. 
when we get to, all right, I'm front face to face or someone's grabbing me, boots on the ground, um, then it transitions into the actual physical techniques that I'm going to specialize in um, that will give a person probably the greatest chance of being able to survive that, that attack and, and walk away and go back to their families. That's so true. That's very well said as well. Um, you know, I think also something that I try to tell my students, impress upon my students, I, I think you would agree with this, is fighting is, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but if I'm trying to make a dramatic statement, I would say it's 50% mindset and 50% technique. You can have people who have great technique, they're amazing technicians, but they don't have the mental fire to be able to really compete with somebody who's like, like a bat out of hell trying to tear your face off. And sure. so you kind of need both. And the problem that we often have is developing that inner fire while not getting burned. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are very mentally aggressive and they're probably the people that are going to be attacking you on the street. But if you want to be able to stand up against them, you have to have that same inner fire, that same strong mental aggression, but you can't live with it every day. And so if you spend too much time in there, you'll, you'll start to embody it in your daily life. And one of the things I always try to tell my students is we're not wolves, we're sheepdogs. You need to live amongst the, the, the flock and protect the flock. And so it's important to um, balance our training with, you know, good intensity from time to time. So we know what that's really like with also um, a more humble, respectful and, and patient environment where you can feel safe and secure. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's no doubt about it. I mean, there is a certain, like, listen, self-defense and being in a physical altercation with another human being, it is, it's, it's difficult. You know, it is down and dirty. Um, it, it's, it's not pretty. It's not scripted like a, like a fight on TV. Um, and uh, it, it definitely is going to require of a person a certain level of, of composure, um, of, of mental discipline, uh, the ability to want to survive and to get out of that physical altercation and be able to get home and visit their family. Um, and there's going to be that, di that, that um, dif difficult, in my opinion, balance of being able to assert themselves physically while still maintaining um, their composure, their breath, their energy management. Because listen, in an attack, it can last 30 seconds and get broken up. Or it can be an attack situation that could go on for 20 minutes until I can get away. So you have to approach it with a certain level of, as I mentioned earlier, there needs to be an order of operations and uh, a certain list of priorities that are important in a self-defense situation like that. Because if I just get into a situation and I'm a berserker, you know, yes, maybe I'm going to go wild for 30 seconds but then maybe I'm going to be out of gas. Maybe my opponent's larger, stronger, still there attacking me. Now I'm the weaker version of myself and they're still doing whatever they want to do to me. So it's a very difficult balance of being, yes, very sharp, mentally engaged in the moment, paying attention to what's going on, being willing to put 100% of oneself um, into the intention of getting away and, and staying safe or thwarting these attack, uh, attacks or attempts but also maintaining that level of mental, physical, even spiritual composure uh, to have one's energy being managed, their breath being managed. Because without that conservation, uh, you know, you, you can be in, in a lot of trouble. I always associate, like if you look at a jiu-jitsu room, which again, uh, Master John, you know, you train, you know. I mean, white belts are typically berserkers, right? They're white belts, they come in, you watch them roll, they're going crazy with each other. They don't have a lot of skill, they just have a lot of will, intention, heart, and they're kind of spazzy. You see blue belts, it's kind of more of the same, maybe a little bit more refined, a little bit more technical. As you get into then purple belt, you know, it's getting a little bit better, brown belt. When you see black belt spar um, that are high level, it's surprisingly calm at times, unless there's a medal on the line. We're not talking about a sports mm -hmm. situation, but if you were to come to my academy and watch me roll with another black belt, it's surprisingly calm. It's su surprisingly technical, not eventful. And some people I think are, oh, that's, I expected it to be really crazy. Um, the higher level of skill demonstrates that one is a bit more um, in control of themselves, more composed, very, very aware of energy management, 
um, very, very aware of efficiency and the things that are incredibly important when you're dealing with a real self-defense situation where the opponent is going to be assumed to be larger, stronger, more athletic, perhaps younger, uh, more aggressive, as you mentioned. Um, we have to assume that that's going to be the opponent or at least train for that. And so the only way we can do that in a real life context is to practice it or rehearse those skills on a daily uh, level in our practice on the mats during class. So this is sort of the approach I'm gonna be bringing to the students at your academy is that sort of mindset, the list of priorities, the order of operations to approach a self-defense situation in the most efficient and, and, and of course the most effective manner uh, that I feel possible. That's great. Yeah. If I can hop in as we're still on the topic of just kind of the wider philosophy behind these self-defense principles, you know, a few things that were running through my head as I was just listening. Um, one thing is this, idea of energy conservation, right? And we just had a guest on last week, um, Jason Brick, and he was talking about taking these principles um, off the mats and into our daily lives, right? Like where we're at the cafe or we're with a group of friends and saying, okay, you know, maybe not so much energy conservation, but okay, like let's play these awareness games. Let's, let's really tap into these things in our daily lives, even off the mats that allow us to stay focused and stay aware and stay not paranoid, but confident in our movements throughout the day. And something that I've been thinking about um, has been the ways in which we allow ourselves to do that. So, you know, we're on the mats and we're rolling and as somebody who is very recently, and my, you know, I've been rolling for, I guess less than a year. I, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe a little bit more. But it, this is so brand new to me. And sure, um, it's so fun to get out there on the mat and like, oh, okay, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. But I I get so tired so fast. And the first thing I think is, oh, I do need to take this second or feel, like feel out this position or okay, just let myself breathe. Like if I'm getting choked from behind, sometimes I think I'm not sure what to do, but I can just breathe right here and taking that mindset, taking that experience and transferring it to um, some kind of overwhelming situation off the mats, right? A, an overwhelming social situation or an overwhelming maybe familial situation where there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of potential for um, maybe pain or discomfort or something, whether it's emotional or physical or mental, whatever. And allowing yourself to just breathe, right? Allowing yourself to take that moment and say, okay, I don't know what's gonna happen next, but I have this moment where I'm still breathing, where I'm still feeling, okay, I, I, I might be able to move from this position. How do you feel? So all that is to, to ask this question. How do you feel you are able to introduce those sorts of things at, at different levels on the mats or at, at different, um, you know, age groups or different demographics that come in uh, into the studio? Like, are you, are, is that something that you are talking about? I know we talk about that sometimes here at the school, like, okay, guys, like, make sure you're breathing, like, take this second right now. Do you, is, you, do you feel how you're feeling? sit with that for a second and then keep moving. So that's- A hundred percent. It's, you know, I think, you know, Master John would agree with me on this as well. Two parts to that, to that question and, and, and the answer. Um, one, yes, by practicing martial arts and a true mastery of martial arts, there will without a doubt be that transfer over into everyday life. There's no question about it. I, I think we all know that as, as martial artists, where um, the composure, the, the mindset that I develop on the mats, um, absolutely translates to life where you said, hey, I might be in a situation where I'm, I'm stressed out in a social situation at a party or a family get together with relatives I don't get along with, or um, I'm in a stressful work situation at a meeting or conflict with coworkers. Um, instead of being a you know, white belt berserker, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have that composure. I'm going to be able to uh, apply a certain strategy to the situation um, and uh, be able to handle it better. So um, if you're truly practicing a, a, a martial art and, and you're trying to master a martial art, um, there's always that focus on it, of course, making us better people, not just on the mats, but outside. So yes, 100%, I'm in agreement with you. 
and um, big part of what we're doing. As far as introducing it at various levels, I think was the second part of your question, um, in the classroom, you know, I think that an, an art like, like jujitsu or, and, and again, taekwondo or, or whatever martial art we're talking about, um, and I'm just gonna speak from a jujitsu uh, perspective at this point, because that's what I'll be teaching and offering. Um, in order to be successful at this art, you have to work these things out. You have to learn energy management. You have to learn efficiency. You have to learn composure or it just doesn't work out for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the mat has a way of teasing out all of the imperfections and you really can't hide from it. Um, if you're getting gassed on the mats, you're getting gassed on the mats. I mean, I can't tell you how many guys are, you know, come in and they, they, they lose on the mats, if you will. Um, you know, they get tapped or they, they don't do well because they're out of gas or out of energy, even if they're skilled individuals. So there's no way for, uh, to hide from it. And that's the mm -hmm. same for little five-year-old kids that are rolling under resistance um, all the way through women, children, men of all levels. And um, it's just, again, the art is presented in a way through live randori and drilling uh, that those elements have to be developed. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, you're you won't progress belt wise, at least at a program like mine, like if, you know, you're trying to be a purple belt or brown belt and you're freaking out every class and, you know, you're completely losing your composure and you're out of breath, out of gas, spazzing out and getting rattled by being on the bottom with a big strong white belt on you. And you're, you're not that level belt. So it's one of those things that I think um, works itself out along the way through the natural process of training, which makes I think the live resistance training so unbelievably powerful and a, a wonderful tool that I think all martial artists should incorporate within their training. Um, so if you want yeah, to maybe add to that. You know. No, that's perfect. No, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I've been striking my whole life and I've been rolling probably the last 20 years and they're so similar and so different at the same time. And there's things I love about both, but First, going back just a step, you were talking about how, you know, as you ascend to the ranks of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you start to get a more of a gentle game. And I've seen that through all martial arts, you know, in Taekwondo, yes. uh, when you go to uh, the national championships here in America, people are trying to kill each other. It's like a, um, it's, it's changing now as we're getting better at Taekwondo in the West, but like in the olden days, it was like blood sport. People were just trying to like take each other's heads off and people were going out on stretchers all the time. Um, but when I went to Korea, everyone was playing this very light, gentle game. And it impressed upon me how the more skilled you get in anything, the more technical you become and the less you resort to being a berserker and the more you resort, resort to playing a really fine and delicate game. And I've seen that with striking. It's absolutely true with grappling because with grappling, once you have hold of somebody, um, you're kind of in their little world and there's only so many ways you can go. And if you don't know your stuff and you don't move in an intelligent way, you have like a limited gas tank. And once that gas tank is done, you just lose every single time. So a smart uh, practitioner will hold on to that gas tank and just go at the level that they need to go to be able to advance to the next position and get that submission, but not uh, to injure their partner, injure themselves, but more, but more practically just not lose all of that energy. And I think that's one of the, the, the special lessons of grappling um, is that grappling has to teach uh, and it teaches it really effectively really early on. Like you're saying, you get those white belts that come in and they're going ham the first round. And then they say, okay, I got to go. And you're like, no, no, no. You got to stay here for 30 more minutes and you got to roll against everybody else. And now you'll see what happens when you waste all of your energy on that first match. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it, it really is. It's a, it's a powerful teaching tool. It's a powerful life tool. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a great thing. And um, that's one of the things that I, I'd like to, to bring to, to, to your academy. And, and again, you know, you have a, a certain level of, of expertise having, I mean, hey, you're rolling for 20 years. That's, that's no joke. That's a long time. Um, but I want to bring the jujitsu that I believe in, the complete jujitsu, that perspective, uh, to the academy, because as I mentioned in an earlier podcast with you, um, it's sort of an 80-20 in the world right now, where I believe like 80% of, of people are doing jujitsu, 
but they're doing a more sportive version of jujitsu and maybe 20 are doing, and 20 is being generous, by the way, maybe 10% are doing a more well-rounded, complete system of jujitsu that was first introduced to the, uh, to America in the, in the early eighties and what people started to become aware of after 93 and hoisted this thing in the UFC. Um, that's sort of a, a very small percentage of jujitsu these days. And the jujitsu that I'm going to be bringing to, to, to Texas, the great state of Texas, which I'm really excited about Say is that. going to be, again, we're going to go through the, again, the list of, of priorities and an order of operations. Like, listen, most fights or confrontations are going to start off on the feet. Mm -hmm. So a student's ability, after we've talked about the avoidance, the awareness, the, you know, verbal de-escalation or assertion, that's not working out, boom. I've got to do something. It's, it's, you know, more than likely going to end up on the feet when you've got most jujitsu guys and a lot of schools these days, you know, master John, you know, you know, clapping hands, bumping fists and starting off on the ground. And there's reasons that they do that, whether they're, you know, guard players or they just want to do it for safety reasons within the Academy and avoiding the takedown game. But um, what I want to do is of course, be able to address that and to get people, if they're trying to get away from someone, the ability, if they're being grabbed to be able to understand base, and to be able to have some simple ways to get away from um, an attack or from very common threat situations and attacks. Or if I'm in a situation where I know it's going down and I've got someone who's kind of crazy acting kind of wild and I have to sort of manage the distance, right? And then choose my opportunity to close the distance, come in, get a hold of that person, as you mentioned, in a way that we're connected and then bring them down on my terms to the ground to be able to control them and use the ground as my friend and help her to do that. And, you know, of course, leverage in jujitsu. Um, I want to be able to address that as well. And that's something that's missing from a lot of the people's jujitsu practice this day. They don't really do the standing self-defense curriculum and they don't really have um, an active sense of drilling, being able to manage the distance or close the distance against someone who's, you know, violent, threatening, maybe trying to hit them. Um, and then once we do get to the ground, um, my jujitsu that I'm teaching is always taking into account the possibility of strikes. And um, again, I come from a striking background, as you know, just like you, Master John and, and, and Jesse as well. So um, I'm very, very comfortable with the idea of, hey, if someone's inside my closed guard, they could be hitting me right now if I'm not paying attention to their hands, their posture where their body's at, how I'm lined up with them, um, how to get past their strikes to get the clinch initially. Um, if I'm on the bottom of side control, how do I deal with strikes? Or even if I'm on the top position from mount, they might be reaching, gouging, trying to grab me. Or if I'm being mounted, for those at, at home that are like, you know, not quite understanding, if I'm laying on my back and somebody's sitting on my belly like a bully trying to hit me, how do I deal with that? And I think the jujitsu that's being taught today is more jujitsu on jujitsu game. I, I know jujitsu. The guy knows jujitsu. We played jujitsu together, as I mentioned in an earlier podcast. The jujitsu that I like to teach is okay. I'm learning jujitsu so that the 99% of the population that doesn't know jujitsu, that might be my attacker, I want to know like how to defend against that person. Again, if they're bigger, stronger, maybe more athletic, heavier, how do I deal with that? Taking in a uh, in account the strikes as well. So my jujitsu approach is a bit different based on that. And that's where it comes in again, again, order of operations, and of course the priorities of a self-defense situation within that context that make the older jujitsu, I think a bit more effective. And this is not a divisive statement. It's not, oh, sports over here and I'm over here. Listen, I've competed enough. I'm no great world champion, but I've competed enough to know about it. I think it has a very, very, important role for people, but it has an important role for people who are competitive, who are competitors. It's not for everyone. Um, my, the jujitsu I'm teaching is going to be great for self-defense, and it can also translate to the sport world, whereas sport jujitsu is wonderful for sport jujitsu and that specific rule set and game, but not necessarily going to transfer over to the street as much when we take into account, again, no time limit, no weight classes, and also striking. Like what you said earlier about composure, listen, if you're not used to um, dealing with strikes in practice and you're not taking that into consideration um, and your game is very dependent upon, you know, getting close to people and diving underneath them in risky ways, 
uh, and foot locking and all these other things, um, you're not going to really be ready for it when it comes in a real life situation under pressure and uh, various conditions. So we need to kind of have that mindset when we're doing our jujitsu. And that's what I'm going to be bringing to your students when I visit. Well, we're really excited because I feel like our mindsets are very similar. Um, and, you know, I, I knew about you through my friend when I was growing up and I could tell from what he was telling me even from a long time ago, before we ever really met and started uh, networking, uh, that you had a very similar mindset. And I really liked that. That's one of the reasons I want to reach out, when to reach out to you in the first place. But one of the things that we're doing at our academy is, you know, I used to have the grappling separate from the striking. And that's why Jesse, even though he's been training with me for over three years, he's only been rolling for about a year because he didn't choose to go to that grappling class. But at, at some point I was like, you know what? This is just so fundamental for self-defense that you, everyone has to learn it. But the question is, how do you teach it? How do you impart those skills in a way that's gonna make everyone feel welcome everyone feels safe because like you said, you know, if we're just doing competitive sparring every single day and people are smashing each other's faces, a lot of those softer souls that come onto the mat the first time are gonna get knocked off immediately, have a bad experience and then everyone will wanna come back. So what we've, what we've done, and this kind of mirrors what you're sort of talking about, I think, is we start, we've integrated them both, but what we do is we do more of the standing game first, the standing, locks and manipulations with the more of the judo throws and takedowns the wrestling takedowns as well and we just we just start from the standing game and once they learn to fall then we proceed to the ground about at blue belt level we'll go to the ground and we'll start doing the standard like Brazilian jiu-jitsu curriculum and then at black belt we so we'll have we'll have our striking days and at blue belt we'll do striking but now you can start to sweep people and yep. on the rolling days, we just all, all it's just standing. You can do standing submissions and you can sweep and take to the ground. And then um, once you get to blue belt over here, you can go all the way to the ground. So, so you're you're alternating between striking and doing sweeps on the on the sparring days. And then on the rolling days, you're going all the way to the ground submissions. But they're kind of separate, right? We don't do any striking over here. We um, we do striking, but we do some sweeps over here. And then once you get the black belt, we bring them both together. So you can do strikes, take them to the ground, everything goes. And so th this is sort of my idea for sort of bringing people to the reality of self-defense, which incorporates all of those things, the strikes, the sweeps, the throws, everything, but doing it in a way that's going to be very approachable to people so they don't get too scared too early. And I'm not saying that because I think I, people are wimps and, they, you know, whatever. I mean, everyone needs that. Like m most people, like a vast majority of people need that. And for me, being a good instructor is all about having a positive effect on the most amount of people. You know, sure. of course, I want to train up those elite athletes and have a, you know those really great students, and we do have those. But I think I would be a bad teacher if I didn't make a great, a great attempt to get as many people as possible involved. So anyway, I don't know what you think about that, but um, I really the the point of this whole thing was to 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 agree with you that I think the striking is very important. And it's one thing that, um, you know, in my sport jujitsu schools that I've trained at in the past, um, sometimes they get mad at me because I'll do a, I'll do a throw, like I'll hip throw somebody. Um, and they will hit the ground really hard, not because I'm trying to throw really hard, but because they go, whoop, they tighten up and sure. then they don't know how to break fall. They could mm -hmm. be like a blue belt and they don't even know how to break fall. Because they've yeah. never, they just pulled guard every single time and sit down. They've never actually been thrown before. And it's kind of like a head scratcher for me because I'm like, this is one of the things you should be learning first. And so in our program, we learn how to fall and roll right from the beginning. And we learn how to, how to sweep and take down. Before we go to the ground, we start working on that stuff. Because if we, if, if we don't, you're going to get hurt on the way to the ground, I think. And no doubt. And like you're doing a tremendous service, obviously, to your students. I mean, as a, as a Taekwondo master, to be able to have the, the wisdom and of the ability to, to make a curriculum or to, to run your classes the way you're mentioning uh, that works for you, works for your school, works for your students. I think it's tremendous and uh, an amazing service to them. Um, and uh, it's certainly... As, I, as you mentioned, the fact that somebody could be in a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu setting and, and not know how to take a break fall to me is just 
it doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, it's kind of crazy. Now we can, everyone has different teaching methodologies and ways of introducing resistance and live rolling or Andori. Um, and and it, it has to be what works, I think, for the individual instructor, the school, the culture there, um, all places do it different. Listen, I ran, before I've had this more recent jujitsu program at my academy that I'm running right now. Um, you know, back in my fight gym days with, uh, you know, my friend and colleague, Scott Burr, who's an amazing black belt. I mean, we had that sort of like, you know, you either like rose to the top or you were getting beat down type, you know, we had a cage. It was a whole, just a completely different culture of jujitsu and MMA. Um, and again, yes, those that can handle it became very tough. Those that didn't, quit and many, many, many quit. So this, this new time around, what I'm doing is, you know, I'm not reinventing the wheel. Um, this is the way the Gracie's taught back in the day in, in Rio at the Academy of Gracie with, you know, when Elio and, and Carlos uh, had the school and Elio was doing a lot of the teaching, you know, and later on, um, uh, there's a curriculum and there's a way to teach students. Um, there is a way to, to, uh, bring people into jujitsu, uh, that teaches them self-defense a confidence based techniques. There's an entire curriculum that you can follow. And that's all I'm doing is, is basically this new program that I'm teaching and, and the way that I'm introduced it uh, to, to your students even is just based on, on, on that curriculum. The Valencia brothers down in Florida do a tremendous job of preserving this. Um, Henry and Hiron uh, at the uh, Gracie Academy through their, you know, their 32 principles or whatever they call it, their combatives course. Yeah. Um, those are all basically repackaged first 40 lessons of ALEO or what they would normally teach at the Gracie Academy and also the way Hori and Gracie was teaching when he first brought jiu-jitsu over to the United States. I mean, you'd go into the Gracie garage back in the day in Torrance before they even had an academy and you were learning standing self-defense. I mean, it wasn't like, hey, we're just going to roll. It was like you learned how to get out of a headlock, how to choke, or grab from behind, um, you know, someone striking, how to, you know, defend, close the distance, take a guy down. I mean, that, that's what jiu-jitsu is. So, I'm following that basic curriculum. And I think it's an, an amazing idea that someone like you as a, as a Taekwondo master, and of course, yes, of course you have you know, a jujitsu background, but to be able to incorporate that into your program the way that you are, and I think it's a very sensible way that makes sense for, for your program, your students, um, I think it's just fantastic. And it's what I've done also in my Kuksu program. You know, as, as you mentioned earlier, yeah, I'm a master of, of Kuksu Do, a, 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 like a Hapkido type offshoot. Yeah. Um, and so all my kids in, in, in Kuksul, they're also grapplers. So it's like they're doing their traditional forms of Kuksul. They're doing all their beautiful kicks. They're doing all the spinning kicks and rebounding off the wall kicks and all that fancy stuff that they love. But they're also learning break falling and they're also rolling and doing takedowns every class as well. So we have, a, have had a way to kind of integrate the two. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. The adults, Master John, I haven't come around so much. The adult, it seems like the adult clientele at my school that likes Kuksul Do, um, they shy away from the grappling and the contact uh, a bit. That's just the culture in, in, in our school. And if they want to do jujitsu, they go to the jujitsu class. I do, however, introduce, like you do, some basic concepts. And Kuksul itself already has a standing self defense curriculum where they are learning joint locks and different holds. They're just not rolling like you would in a jujitsu environment. Yeah, no, I think that's pretty common. You know, a lot of people who are attracted to traditional martial arts and striking don't really want to get down on the ground and roll around. But yeah. I, I, I'm sort of with the mindset that this is just a personal thing. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't have to get into it too much, but like, I just don't want to um, have seven different programs in my school and be jumping around and doing all that kind of stuff. And I'm the kind of person who's like, um, you got to eat your, if you want to, the pie, you've got to eat some of your vegetables, you know, like this is yeah. important stuff. And I, I mean, you don't have to go every day. We actually have a rotating curriculum. So if you want to skip over the rolling day, you can, you know, but it's, it's going to be in there and you're going to have that opportunity. And eventually you're going to have to do it as you, you know, get to the higher ranks so that, you know, my yep. black belts are very proficient martial artists. Um, but anyway, I think this is a good segue for us to jump into technical aspects. Like, what are your um, go-to moves uh, for self-defense? And I know it might be a little hard for us to talk about without getting into it, but I think that's good because I want to save some of those, you know, the real concrete bits for the seminar so people want to come to the seminar. But like, 
what, like what's it taste like? What are some of your essential self defense moves that you you teach uh, at the very beginning? Yeah, I mean it's 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 again kind of a, it's a tough question. It's a good question, but it's a tough question because it's you know I just have a, a working body of 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 knowledge, and I just sort of do my best um, to be able to react in, in this in the situation. But for the most part. I think the ability to, um, no matter how someone orients themselves to you, let's say a guy grabs me from the front, the back, just having the ability to establish base connection with the floor, the person, um, some structural integrity to be able to then um, get away from them or to make um, that entanglement in your favor is something that is is priority number one number two um having the ability to um work guard on the bottom i think is a very important part of self-defense because if i'm on the bottom of a, of a fight um being able to recover guard and for those that are maybe watching and like eh, i'm not familiar with this with the vernacular or whatnot but being able to put my limbs between myself and the person trying to hurt me um you know the classic version of closed guard my legs are going to wrap around their waist and i'm going to control their bodies or even it could just be like my arms it can be the bottoms of my feet my shins my knees what have you to be able to protect myself so having some sort of an amazing guard i think is essential for self-defense off of a bottom position and then i would say just like if the person would to breach your guard meaning they're going to get past my limbs and my legs and be able to get control of my upper body and my hips being able to sit over me, uh, being able to be composed on the bottom that way and being able to escape mount, whether I roll them over or being able to recover guard are probably my most go-to moves. And it's not the most glamorous answer. Yes, I've got a really good triangle and I have some great moves that are awesome, um, you know, up close throwing elbows and making space and distance. But I mean, honestly, it's the ability to, no matter how you're grabbing me, I need to feel where you're grabbing me, how. And I have to protect wherever you happen to be grabbing me if there's something that's on the line that's vulnerable, like my neck or an arm. And then being able to have, again, the structural integrity in my body to be able to kind of hold my own and then sort of affect the both of us or interact with what's going on, take it to a more favorable place or get away completely. Um, that's huge. Um, being able to, as a smaller guy, I know you probably can't tell on camera, but I'm like 5'7", 150 pounds. I'm not a big Herculean guy. I certainly don't look tough. Um, so for me to be able to like, again, if I'm on the bottom of the fight with a bigger person that's trying to hurt me, just being able to maintain guard or to be able to escape from a bottom position like mount and stay safe at least um, is of paramount importance. So, I mean, that's, those are some of the things that I think are kind of like my go-to moves. If people roll with me, they're always like, oh man, I'm having a hard time getting past your guard. Or every time I think I'm past, you keep recovering guard on me, mm -hmm. you know, because I think it's that is incredibly important. Or I'll just say, hey, mount me. That's how I'll train with some guys. Okay, mount me. And then I'll let them start from mount. They'll try to submit me and I'll get out. They're like, shucks, you know, um, because I stay calm on the bottom and can get out. And that's something I'm practicing. So yeah. that and uh, the standing self-defense is, I think, you know, where where I um, maybe shine the most and can give some interesting perspective, I think, um, to students. That's great. I mean, I think that's, that's a, those are all really important points that you know, students need to be aware of. A couple of things that we do here at the school, I don't know how you feel about this, but we start with our weight belt. We have uh, self-defense and I'm excited for you to come and uh, you're gonna stay for the evaluation and so you can kind of see some of this stuff. Um, I look forward to it for sure. Yeah, we're, we're hugely honored. Thank you so much, sir. But um, we'll start out with our, our white belt curriculum. We have defenses for every rank. And our white belt defenses, we start out with wrist grab escapes and tackle yeah. defenses. Because I feel like those are two really important things, especially for a striker. You don't want to get taken to the ground. Oh, no, exactly. You can't really do much submission. You can do some, like if you get really lucky, standing submissions. Uh, one of the reasons why we start with standing submissions is not because it's an effective way to submit so up, but because it feels safe still like when you're standing mm -hmm. trying to do some an arm bar and you can learn to apply those on the ground later and once you know i'm standing it's, it's very easy to transition to the ground but anyway getting taken to the ground as a grappler is going into a world that you don't know much about and so that's a very important first step like learning how to defend how to sprawl how to defend against like a single leg or a double leg takedown very important okay. and then you know if you grab somebody's wrist 
Then you can grab their elbow. You can do an elbow drag. You can get around oh. behind them. You can, you know, slam them to the ground and get on top of them. And it all starts from that wrist grab. So understanding the principles of, you know, where do you get out? You know, where's the weak point between the thumb and the fingers? How, you know, pulling your arm to your body to gain more leverage with your core. All of these things are really important to teach, I think, at the very beginning, because if you have trouble, I mean, you know, if you roll with a good grappler, sometimes it's hard to get your grips on because the person's like breaking your grips with their knees and, and, and yeah. you know, escaping, you know, and that's a really good first skill to have if you want to be able to get away and uh, use your strikes. Mm -hmm. I agree 100%. And, it's, and you just like the Gracie curriculum is designed as well. I mean, it's like, you know, basic wrist escapes and basic defense. The guy's trying to tackle me. How do I frame and defend? Like you said, a sprawl or make some kind of uh, distance and space, get the hips back. I mean, all super solid stuff. And uh, no, I think it's great. Uh, definitely, you know, a, a great way to do it. And uh, yeah, super. No doubt about it. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Um, well, uh, any other thoughts, Jesse? I mean, I know we've taken a lot of your time already, but we really appreciate you coming on. Mm, yes, sir. I mean, I, I don't have anything now. I'm sure by the time you get here uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll, I'll definitely have some questions for you after the seminar, which I'm super excited for. But for today, again, just thank you for, for coming on. It was a little short notice, but you got it. We Put really together. appreciate you coming yes, on for such, such short notice, but um, we wanted to put, you know, a, a face with a name and, you know, show them, you know, what solid of a guy you are who's going to be coming here and teaching these mm. great skills because we want to get as many people on the mats as possible. So if, if you're a student here at Rise of Phoenix Martial Arts, listen up, guys. you got to come to this seminar. The more people who come to this seminar, the more seminars we're going to be have, able to have in the future. We can have Master Jason back or we can have some other instructors as well, but it really is contingent on how many people come out to this seminar. Um, this is our first, you know, paid official seminar that we're having since we, since COVID and actually since we opened because um, uh, we've only been here for about five years. But um, so we want to see as many people get out there as possible and it's going to be a really good one. I think we're going to learn a lot. Well, if I could just add to that, like if I'm, if I'm speaking to your student base or potential student base or people that might be attending this, it's like, you know, you're, you're doing the legwork in a sense that, um, you know, I've, without throwing names down or, or being cheesy, um, I've been able to train with, with, with some really good people in the art that I'm representing, uh, people that are highly sought after and in some cases incredibly hard to train with um, no matter what, you just can't. And I'm, I'm gonna be coming to, to your area, Master John, you've, you've put the, you know, the effort in, in to bring me out. So like you're, you're hand delivering uh, to potential participants and your students um, this knowledge where they don't have to necessarily travel a great distance to be able to get it. Um, you're making it very convenient for them. And so I think it's it's certainly important if, if you have the time, if you have the ability, have the desire to improve your martial arts technique, you know, you attend the seminar. Um, some of it may be similar and stuff that you've learned before. Some of it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, it might be a slightly different perspective or some things may be said in a way that resonate with certain individuals in a way that can really change their game. So um, yeah, I look forward to it. As you can probably tell, I'm incredibly passionate about what I do. I love this. I'm a career martial artist and I would love to be able to bring what I've learned from some of the, the, the best jujitsu people in the business still living um, that sort of jujitsu to your, to your academy and to your students' lives and to improve them just a little bit, give them something to think about. So if you can make it, I'd love to see everybody there. And I look forward to, you know, I never go to Texas. I've been to Texas uh, back in the day. I used to compete at the uh, Houston Astrodome uh, okay, with, wow. with traditional martial arts, believe it or not. And I just drove through there with my family on like a 6,000 mile road trip. I came through Texas, stayed in maybe Plano. So um, looking forward to visiting Texas and your students and Master John. And of course, uh, Jesse, I think you guys are really quality individuals and outstanding martial artists. And it's an honor to be invited into your, into your dojang and uh, to share what I've learned. So mutual respect and uh, mutual benefit. I appreciate uh, you having me. So I look forward to it, guys. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Let's be there, guys. All right. Cool. Master Jason, Professor Jason, until we see you in person, have a great week, and we'll see you here in just a couple of weeks. You too, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day. Yes, sir. Thank you. If you enjoyed that podcast, please consider liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel, as well as hitting the notification bell. 
We offer in-person group and private lessons at our facility in Kyle, Texas, as well as virtual lessons anywhere in the world. If you'd like to learn more about our programs, you can find us online at risingphoenixtkd.com.